Let's say you've got a character, an ordinary guy, let's call him One Jack, and a mob boss killed his dog, and now he wants revenge. A dish best served cold, with a side of grittiness and oh god, what have I done? <laughs> Often a terrible idea, but not always? Well, I've been looking at all these stories to understand why revenge stories are hard to write and how to do them well. Because come on, I know you, you know me, you're here to learn things, and you can do even more of that over at Nebula, the creator-owned platform that sponsored this video, link down below. Woo! Let's go! Part 1, writing intense emotion. Good revenge stories aren't just about revenge, right? See, there's this old saying that good zombie shows aren't about zombies, they're about people. Good war stories aren't about war, but they're about sacrifice and suffering. And good revenge stories aren't about revenge, they're about obsession and trauma and survivor's guilt and rage and lack of control in your life and lack of resolution and that sort of thing. So when we're writing it, we're not so much writing revenge as we are writing intense emotions, often exploring a mix of grief and anger, like, I don't know, an ordinary dude like one jerk whose dog was murdered, or Stephen King's Carrie facing bullying. Grief, rage, jealousy are really dynamic emotions, and learning how to capture them and other intense emotions is fundamental to selling us on your revenge story. I know women whose entire personas are woven from a benign mediocrity. Their lives are a list of shortcomings. The unappreciative boyfriend, the extra ten pounds, the dismissive boss, the conniving sister, the straying husband. I've always hovered above their stories, nodding in sympathy and thinking how foolish they are, these women, to let these things happen. How undisciplined. Poor dumb bitch. I could hear the tale, how everyone would love telling it. How amazing Amy, the girl who never did wrong, let herself be dragged penniless to the middle of the country where her husband threw her over for a younger woman. How predictable. How perfectly average. How amusing. And her husband? He ended up happier than ever. No. I couldn't allow that. No. Never. Never. He doesn't get to do this to me and still fucking win. No. He does not get to win. So I began to think of a different story that would make me the hero, aweless and adored, because everyone loves the dead girl. I've watched him ogle himself in the mirror, grooming himself like a horny baboon for their dates. I've listened to his lies, 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 from simplistic child's BS to elaborate Rube Goldbergian contraptions. I've tasted butterscotch on his dry kiss lips, a cloying aver that was never there before. I've felt the stubble on his cheeks that he knows I don't like, but apparently she does. Very few people can capture intense emotion like Gillian Flynn, one of my favorite authors. Just read sharp objects, just do it, don't look anything up about it, just read it, channeling my inner biggest dickless there. Now the most common advice around bringing out emotion is about physicalizing it on a line by line level, right? She threw up her hands in the air, she shoved the dishes into the dishwasher. And yet these all channel character emotion to character action without saying it, subtext, but these books do a lot more to capture that intense emotion as well. Look at that passage from Gone Girl. This is all stream of consciousness filled with rage, but more importantly, look at what she focuses on when narrating. She contrasts herself with other women and her husband, describing them as animals, poor, dumb bitch, like a baboon, infantilizing them as girls, while her word choice uses passive verbs rather than active words for them, to highlight them as subservient, controlled, even lesser. All of this brings out condescension and resentment, layering that anger with other emotions, making it a more specific experience. It's not just anger at her husband, but other women. She does physicalize in this passage, you know, tasted, felt, but these are secondary. Over and over, these authors would look for the emotions beneath the emotion. For Carrie, it's humiliation and isolation. You know, this, this kid who's been repeatedly bullied by everyone around her at school, and now she's getting her revenge. For Amy in Gone Girl, it's resentment and condescension. For the ordinary dude, one jerk whose dog was murdered, it might be hatred and despair. Because it's never just anger, it's anger as a mix of other emotions. Focusing on things that channel those underlying feelings, rather than just describing, oh how a flame caught a light inside him as one jerk took up his gun, you can bring out the more complex human experience that leads them to want revenge. So you can bring all of this out with introspection, like Gone Girl, you know, we're spending a lot of time in this, in, in Amy's head, understanding her. But there are other ways to bring this out on a scene by scene level, you know, in your actual prose, in your story beats, because intense emotions 
interrupt. The sheets were still folded open from the morning Hoshiko got out of bed. For a moment, Miumi thought the pillow still bore the imprint of her small head. After all, it lay unmoved all this time, on a diagonal the way Hoshiko used to sleep, legs folded either side so she could hug it, and it could hug her back. She stopped sucking her thumb when she was six, though it took threatening braces to stop her. Hoshiko had nightmares most nights before they bought that pillow. She would shuffle into their room, fingers toiling, and wait by Miumi's bedside until some unconscious awareness woke her up and Miumi would see the silhouette looking down at her. The girl didn't want to shake her awake, but also did not quite realize standing there like that was something out of a horror film. Medhavdas always volunteered to sleep in Hoshiko's bed so she could sleep with someone. She slept easiest as the little spoon. It was never a good night's sleep, but it was always worth it. Okay, I'll do the bed last. This scene is about grief, and it's actually from my book, which is why I've got one of these folders that I sent out to my beta readers. It's currently out with agents right now, and I've already got a request for a full. Real excited, don't know where that's gonna go. And by the way, if you haven't got them yet, uh, On Writing and World Building Volume 1 and Volume 2 are out, and Volume 3 is coming at the end of the year. It's gonna be awesome. So you can get it for Christmas and it'll come with another writing surprise, which I will not reveal just yet, but you will see. They got all the writing and world building content we talk about and tons more discussion that's exclusive to the books. Links down below. But I want to show how grief can derail your thought patterns. This is a story about a young mum who has lost her daughter and she comes in and tries to clean up the bedroom, but finds herself dwelling on the past of the blankets, the pillow, then the nightmares, then her relationship with her estranged husband, which isn't really to do with what she wanted to do in their in the first place but then she drags herself back to reality and realizes that no I, i'm not going to clean up the bed grief interrupts her thought patterns and takes her somewhere else on a tangent step by step but it's also physical in this scene she doesn't just see the pillow but how her daughter lay in her bed gone girls amy doesn't just see other women but a list of shortcomings she wants to avoid. Intense emotions change how we interpret the world. It's physical in that sense, because we look around and we see experiences and memories, and that interpretation is just as vital, if not more vital, than saying things like, the ordinary man, one chick whose dog was murdered, clenched his fists with fury. Show me their anger by interrupting their daily life, their interactions with other people, how it derails their thoughts at the wrong moment when they should be focused on something else, but also show me how it shapes the way they view the world. And this is important because not every revenge story is about someone who is constantly physicalizing, angrily shoving dishes in the dishwasher out of control of their emotions and the way they react, you know? Uh, this applies to someone who just happens to be a calm, single-minded, very stable human who wants revenge, you know? They're still gonna look around without breaking down and see a world that is kind of filtered through that emotion and that desire. They're still gonna see memories and experiences and things that make them angry, sad, or jealous, you know? Recognize that, because any revenge story is underpinned by us two feeling those intense emotions, us being there with them. That's kind of the whole thing about our revenge story is that we want to be on board with these characters. The critical part of Hamlet is not that Hamlet gets his revenge on Claudius for killing his dad, but the struggle over whether he should take it in the first place, the intense rage and guilt he feels for his failures. To be or not to be is why Hamlet is one of the greatest stories ever written, and the 2004 Punisher film starring Thomas Jane was not. But physicalization is still really important, and as I was reading all of these... As I was reading all of these stories, I knew that there was just no better book for this than Stephen King's Carrie. She slammed them shut again, catching somebody's fingers, it felt like Dale Norbert, in the jam and severing one of them. She began to reel across the lawn again, a scarecrow figure with bulging eyes towards Main Street. Smiling, staggering, her heart beating at over 200 per minute, she began to walk down toward Grass Plaza. She was unaware that she was scrubbing her bloodied hands against her dress like Lady Macbeth, or that she was weeping even as she laughed, or that one hidden part of her mind was keening over her final and utter ruin. King here physicalizes the rage Carrie feels with simple words 
words like slamming a door as opposed to closing it, but captures her out of controlness with staggering, reeling, weeping, even as she laughed, keening over these contradictions, likening her to a scarecrow and Lady Macbeth, unaware of quite what she's doing. But he stays away from cliches, and the bodily stuff always brings new emotions, or it changes the emotion in some way. Like here, she becomes more and more unhinged with each action, with each verb, from actively slamming a door to not even knowing she's scrubbing her bloodied hands. When you're physicalizing, let your actions bring new information to the reader. So let's say the ordinary man, Wong Jik, whose dog was murdered, is sitting there, bent over a picture of his dog, brushing it tearfully, but then, he picks up a gun with a shaky grip. Well, that gives us new information, doesn't it? It shows a shift in his decision making. One of the hallmarks of Stephen King's writing is he doesn't tend to rely on abstract metaphors all that much, especially in moments of intense emotion or action. He instead uses very grounded, very physical, often very uncomfortable bodily descriptions, capturing violence, intense emotion, anger, grief, rage, revenge. And we see that in this passage because relying too much on like abstract imagery and thinking and abstract descriptions of emotions can come across as melodramatic because intense emotions, they are very grounded in reality, they are what attach us most viscerally to the world around us, you know. We can instantly connect them to things in the world. I talk about this in my video on subtext, linked up in the corner. But connected to this, showing us gruesome violence, you know, what they're willing to do just isn't enough to get us into this revenge story. Because something that really came across as I was looking at all these stories is that the best ones really help us understand what these characters lost. And not just, oh, I lost my wife, oh, I lost my dog, oh, I lost my home, but what those things represented to people psychologically. Because people and objects and places, they are something to us kind of symbolically. They are part of our emotional makeup. In Gone Girl, Amy's husband took away her sense of independence and pride. And in Carrie, they took away her self-confidence and feeling of community. She doesn't feel like she belongs anymore. And revenge grows out of that. That's what we need to feel. And in there, the emotions behind the emotion. I don't think it's enough to show the ordinary man Wan Jek whose dog was murdered losing his dog. It's gotta be that, I don't know, the dog was the last memory he had of his wife who left it for him after dying and she was the one person who made him feel worth anything in the first place. So sure, in your revenge story, give your character the body count of your average COD player, but figure out what your characters, objects, and places mean relative to one another, so that when we take it away, we can see that void, we feel that void, what they represented. And when characters come into conflict, we know what's at stake. You know, that's that's what it is. We know what's important to these characters and why. Because stories aren't just, you know, static points. They're, they're string that tie all these pieces together and tangle and get messy, pulling on each other so that tension rises until eventually something snaps and then you've got conflict and fallout and consequences and revenge and we can call that the story web so you're looking for those threads pulling on each other the netflix show ozark does this fantastically and i'm gonna speak carefully here because i don't want to spoil it but one group of characters desperately needs to keep some terrible person alive but one of the good guys wants revenge and wants them dead for pretty good reasons the terrible person represents a way out of a terrible situation for the former group and the source of their suffering for another. But when that person does manage to get their revenge, of course, the first group just falls apart. Suddenly, oh no, things are bad again. The first group is left to pick up the pieces. And not only that, but it destroys the relationship these characters ever had and pushes the plot forward into newer, bigger obstacles than ever before. So intense emotion grows out of introspection, out of interruption, out of physicalization, but that's on a line by line level. Revenge is an arc. And that's why so much of the meaning in these stories can be found in part two, revenge as a chain of decisions. In Gone Girl, her rage becomes framing her husband for murder. In Three Kinds of Silence, she decides not to clean up the bed. In Carrie, she decides to kill everybody. Intense emotions are only so intense as they actually motivate the characters to do anything, which is, again, why describing feelings in the abstract can be melodramatic, because 
it's just a character sort of feeling but not doing anything. So you're looking for these beats where characters are motivated to run, to fight, to leave, to isolate themselves, to be reckless, to throw themselves into a battle where they might get killed. In The Last of Us Part 2, Ellie's grief motivates her to seek revenge for Joel's death. Her anger means she murders so many people, so, so many people. God, my God, so many people. Her, her love for Dina though, and desire for peace makes her return home and turn away from that revenge. Uh, for a bit. Then her anguish makes her seek out revenge again, even though Dina begs her to stay. Her despair at the pointlessness of it all means that she ends up letting Joel's killer go, leaving behind the guitar he taught her how to play, a symbol of their past. Now, her emotions are intense in this story, not just because of how much she physicalizes it or how much it interrupts her life, but because of the pace it brings to the story driving the story forward as she's motivated to make all these decisions. And these decisions mean something thematically and personally, affecting her relationship with Dina, with these feelings constantly forcing action and reaction from others, and changing the relationship that we have as the viewer slash player with her from the outside. But more than that, the chain of decisions colors the meaning of the eventual revenge scene. Is it satisfying? Is it depressing? Every decision Ellie makes brings her closer to getting revenge, but it also exposes more of the part three costs of revenge. At first, it's satisfying because we're all in on the rage boat and they deserve this, and she spares the lives of some people on her warpath, but she kills more and more people as she goes for worse and worse reasons. And Dina begs her to stop, to keep this life they've built together on this beautiful farm, to not leave it, but Ellie can't let her rage and anguish go. It destroys their relationship. It's horrible. And more than that, Ellie used to be the moral compass, the optimist who persuaded Joel to be less violent. And look at what she has become. She finds no catharsis, and the player lost it long ago. We want her to stay on the farm in so many ways. There's this divergence between what we want as the players and what she wants as a character, and all of this alters Ellie's revenge to feel horrifically depressing. Just another point in a cycle of violence. There are these personal and interpersonal costs that color the meaning of that revenge as the story goes on, so that it's a very different thing at the end to what it was at the start. But I mean, come on, revenge stories aren't always like this. V for Vendetta is basically the Count of Monte Cristo for edgy teenagers. I would know. The Count of Monte Cristo. But I love it. I stand by it. Who doesn't love watching Parliament get blown up to Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture? <laughs> And the story starts off as this like lonely quest born of anger, but as he adopts Evie and begins to reconnect with humanity again, eventually sacrificing his own life to get his revenge and kill Chancellor Sutler, and we see more and more how pathetic and deserving Sutler is to die, that revenge only gets sweeter. V hands over the reins of his revolution to someone he considers better for it, Evie, and it succeeds. Getting revenge in this story means character development for V and justice, as this chain of decisions shows more and more how evil and pathetic these people are. Same with Django Unchained, by the way. If someone is kept from their revenge over and over by bad people, and we see how much worse they are over and over, we just want to see them dead. The path justifies it more and more. The tension in both The Last of Us and V Vendetta rises as our characters get closer and closer to their revenge, and in both stories, the meaning of that revenge shifts because of the obstacles and story beats that precede it, that lean up to it, the chain of decisions but one becomes depressing while the other is immensely satisfying. Although having a truly evil person who deserves to die for what they did can be a really compelling way to explore obsession and what the pursuit of revenge does to a person and their relationships, it's not just a choice between forgiveness and revenge, which a lot of revenge stories do only focus on this binary choice, but it's also, you know, moving on and revenge. Even if the person deserves to die for what they did, what we do in the face of true evil is a really fundamental question. But moving on and forgiveness are two different things. They're two different psychological experiences. So you've got to remember, you know, revenge stories as part of these story webs, which are tangling, you know, these points which are pulling on each other uh, until something snaps.
Ellie losing Dina really sucks because it represents Ellie choosing the past over the future, her rage over happiness. So how does revenge affect other characters in your story? Maybe they lose faith in the person seeking it, or they're inspired to seek it themselves and it's this horrible cycle they pass on to their children, or maybe they're inspired to seek forgiveness for their own wrongs instead. Or, once the revenge happens, it kicks off a cycle of violence that puts other people in danger, dragging in new threats. Think about what you want the reader or audience to feel when we get to that eventual revenge scene, and colour the meaning of that revenge with the events and decisions of the story that show, one, what it cost them to get there, you know, their morals, their friends, their responsibilities, and two, that show a shift in how they deal with the emotions beneath the emotions. Because it's not the revenge on its own that makes it meaningful, it's all that context around it. When V gets his revenge, it's partly him accepting that his desire for personal justice is not totally compatible with his desire for societal justice, for revolution. If it's meant to be satisfying, show me how they were kept from it, how it becomes more deserved over time. Revenge though is often a last resort, you know, it's because a person cannot deal with their emotions in any other way, it's that rope snapping, so they turn to it. Their stories here are less about revenge and they're more often about trauma, about survivor's guilt, about obsession. And you can structure these narratively with a set of or questions. A character can have their revenge or freedom slash friend slash a wife. How many times does your character make that choice? How many times do they choose revenge? And each time they do choose it, you can complicate it and make it harder next time. So first it's revenge or a peaceful life, then it's revenge or your morality, then it's revenge or your oldest friend, then it's revenge or any semblance of happiness or sanity or any home to return to. Each time a character makes these decisions, it'll ramp up the tension and make these decisions more painful. One common trope is to complicate the revenge at the last moment, you know, like they finally find them and they realize the person has repented and is trying their best to redeem themselves. What then? Sometimes it's funny when the antagonist doesn't even know what they did. I don't even know who you are. But it is because of the immense costs of revenge that a lot of these stories lend themselves to part four corruption arcs, or at least negative arcs like Ellie's. Anakin's desire for revenge for his mother for being wronged leads him to lose his moral core, his allies and his love. These stories hinge on moral dilemmas, oftentimes where we empathize with why they want something but not how far they're willing to go or what they're doing but not the reasons that they're doing it for. And slowly that desire for revenge grows to the point that it dominates their more redeeming qualities and can even go full on villain depending on your perspective betraying allies and friends to get what they want, even if it's for good reasons that we initially understood. If you're wanting motivation for a fallen hero turned villain or the like, revenge can be a pretty compelling one. You know, see Magneto Syndrome Ahab. Breaking Bad isn't a revenge story, but it is a corruption arc, and what makes it so great is how much debate there is over when Walter White became Heisenberg, the villain, and to this point it's basically a meme. But the story is such a tangled mess of morality that it, it, it's hard to know. And this way you can leave your stories as this complex tangle of emotions where at some point the reader might split off from your character wanting revenge. But everyone's going to disagree about where that might be. One way this corruption art can manifest is in how they carry out the actual revenge, you know? Maybe it's perfectly warranted, we're totally behind it, but then they start to do some pretty horrific things when they finally get their revenge on the guy. Symmetricity will often come up at this point in the story where the character does to the villain what the villain did to them, and this can be pretty dark. Sicario involves a man killing his nemesis's family in front of him for revenge, including children, paying back what the guy did to him. I mean, but those were innocent kids. But it can also be a bit more complicated, you know, Beer Town has a girl pin down the man who sexually assaulted her and point a gun in his face and threaten him with his life to make him terrified. And this is part of her retaking control, uh, having a sense of, you know, independence again. But you're meant to think, is this the healthiest way to deal with this? Especially because the story suggests she might kill him. And this is why so many revenge stories are just as much about the revenge as they are what happens part five after revenge. Stories saying revenge isn't worth it are about as old as revenge itself. We really haven't moved on from the Iliad all that much. It channels age old struggles over giving into anger, into grief, over what justice even means and how to deal with injustice. A lot of revenge stories deal with what comes after so much as the road towards it. This is because we tend to moralize revenge a lot more than we do other story tropes. 
probably because too much revenge and the judicial system and society just entirely falls apart. The Count of Monte Cristo is the archetypical revenge story and it sees Edmund Dante get his revenge but he's unsatisfied and left feeling empty and despondent and we have to weigh the morality of his actions, what he did to what were once his friend, taking away their money and status and ruining their lives including some who regretted what they did to him. Until the day when God will deign to reveal the future to man, all human wisdom is contained in these two words, wait and hope. Tyrion gets his revenge against Tywin in A Storm of Swords with perhaps one of the best lines in the series. He kills Tywin while he's sitting on the toilet and it says at the end, it turns out in the end, Tywin Lannister did not shit gold. <laughs> but after this, Tyrion falls deeper and deeper into rage and violence and does some truly horrific things that just never made it into the TV show. Revenge becomes a gateway drug for him to do a lot worse things. And revenge is kind of like that, you know? Revenge can be just as often be about a feeling of being hard done by, undeservedness, and that can justify a lot of things in the minds of many. A little violence for this slight can lead you to do more violence for lesser slights in the future. It really depends what you want to discuss in human psychology because that is what these stories are. And actually, structurally, some stories will give the hero their revenge at the midway point so that they can pull the rug out from under us and expose our own biases as the reader. You wanted this? Fine. Now let's look at the fallout. Let's look at the consequences. Did we even think about the valuable things we lost along the way about what's left behind? But you don't have to say that, and a lot of revenge stories don't. Revenge does not have to be self-destructive. In the same way Iron Man fighting bad guys instead of leaving it to the government doesn't have to be seen as anarchy. Revenge can be framed as justice. Stieg Larsson's Millennium Trilogy is probably best known for its dark serial killer novel The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but if you actually read it, the whole series is really a deep critique of the Swedish government institutions and how they deal with vulnerable people, including Lisbeth Salander, the iconic heroine with a vengeance kick after her traumatic childhood. So she ends up tying down her abuser and tattooing a confession of what he did to her on her stomach. And I cannot show you what she tattooed for these reasons, but her revenge and many of the other illegal activities we see throughout the series are specifically framed in the light of the failure of government institutions to address real problems, to bring justice on their own. And it's satisfying. Yeah, it's, it's horrifying, but it is satisfying. Lisbeth actually attains a degree of peace in her vengeance, and it's not a corruption arc like you see with John Wick, or, or one Jick I mean. But let's be honest, the draw of the John Wick films isn't because they're a beautifully subtle Shakespearean revenge story, it's because of the action set piece. And that's cool! But again, the events of the story colour the meaning of that vengeance because we see how corrupt these institutions are. One of my favourite moments in The Last Airbender is when Katara finally confronts the man who killed her mother, but finds she can't kill him in revenge. Now, Aang thinks this is because she chose the path of forgiveness and healing, but Katara insists it's because she's too weak and that she doesn't forgive him, that some wounds just can't be healed like that. Revenge here isn't portrayed as the answer, but neither is forgiveness portrayed as the ultimate good. Revenge exists in this morally grey world, and your story can reject this kind of moral binary that condemns revenge as a purely corruptive force. Revenge might be justice even if it doesn't bring peace. One of the cliche ways this often comes across is, you know the scenes where they go, if you kill him, you'll be just like him. You know the meme where it's like, what about all the children you kill? What murder? Oftentimes it's just a false equivalency and you, you turn around and you're like, he killed 50 innocent people. They were like children. And I want to kill him? And that's the same? Seriously? I love how Death Note subverts this in a really funny way with Ryuk telling Light, hey, if you kill all the bad people, you'll be the only bad person left. To which Light promptly says, I am God and I will create a new perfect world. If you hadn't picked up that this was a corruption arc yet. And this trope is especially egregious if the hero just killed like, dozens of henchmen who were probably not as bad as the main guy to get to the villain. Where was the morality play for them? No, we have to save fantasy Hitler. But you can play with morality like this. The choice to not kill at the end of a revenge story can be meaningful. Ellie letting Abby go at the end isn't her being like, 
I won't be like you, like you kill Joel. It's her going, I realize now the moment is here that none of this was worth it. All the killing I've done was was pointless and I am so broken inside. Or if alternatively your character hasn't killed anyone before but promises they will do this one, then this marks a pretty pivotal moment of character change, right? In Seven, the choice to kill the serial killer is all about overcoming his flaw of wrath and rage, which he ultimately fails. He does kill him, and this actually brings the villain's plan full circle. And it sucks, and it's painful, but it comes out of that decision to kill or not kill. Part six, revenge as tension. Remember that story web of points tugging and pulling on each other till something snaps? Well, if revenge is your character's motivation, then it's pulling on all of these things in a certain direction towards revenge. And you wanna see what problems that creates. Because revenge isn't just a moral quandary, right? It can create problems on its own. Perhaps the ordinary guy, Wanjek, whose dog was murdered, getting his revenge means it sets the guy's whole family on him and it turns out they run an international assassin ring. Wow, I should make this movie. It'd, it'd be fantastic. I'd get like four of them, yeah? Four of them, I think. Revenge stories often rely on flashbacks to show us what happened, what brought this character to this point. And I've made a whole video about them uh, in the past. Go check them out. But withholding information from the reader, from the viewer, about why a character wants revenge can be a really effective point of tension, where we see the effects of what happened, the depression, the rage, the intense emotions, but not what it sparked from until later. And then when we're given that information, it can recontextualize the story. The Revenant actually does this quite a bit. Especially because remember the emotions beneath the emotion. When it's a mixture of jealousy and resentment, these things can often be directed at the wrong people in the wrong ways. And that can cause tension with other characters along the way. God of War Ragnarok plays with this, where Freya's anger and grief is misdirected at Kratos instead of the person who kind of orchestrated the death of her son. Odin. It's only in redirecting these emotions in the story and building a relationship with Atreus that the revenge quest can go a better way and the revenge quest can change. But sometimes revenge is just the desire of like a side character, someone who comes into the story, not the main character. And in that case, you're, you're looking at kind of how that desire, because it's a pretty disruptive desire, can interrupt and disrupt the story. Even if it's not the central point of tension, how does it pull on that central thread? What does it comment on the struggles that the main characters are dealing with? How does it change that? How does it make them make new decisions or alter the decisions they were going to make? Or how does it prevent them from going to do the thing they wanted to do? How does it complicate the themes that we've been presented with, a wrinkle in our moral understanding of this world? Formula Alchemist Brotherhood does this really well. The central drive of our characters is to find a Philosopher's Stone to help them heal something, right? But they come across a lot of characters who want revenge, and they become obstacles, competitors to find the stone. They become clues or misdirections that develop the wider conspiracy that is wrapped around all of this. They complicate the quest along the way. And Roy Mustang, who wants revenge for the murder of his co-worker, channels that rage into uncovering this conspiracy in his beloved nation, leading it towards a better future. There are positive arcs that grow out of this revenge and force our main characters to change direction and wrestle with new problems. A while ago, I did a video on writing character emotions, like the intense ones we find all the time in revenge stories, but I've actually got a whole other video with a bunch of books and analysis that I didn't have room for there or in this video. And if you want to delve deeper, then I really recommend checking it out, as well as lesson from the screenplays videos on revealing your character's ghost, as often happens in revenge stories, looking at Star Wars Fallen Order, and their video on compelling first person storytelling. There's a whole series of this you can watch linked down below called Story Mode, and all of this is available over on Nebula. See, us creators, yeah, me and all of these people, we own Nebula, not even kidding. So. Supporting it is supporting us. I just did a video on how AI might change the world and how it's changing the creator economy. So I would love for you to support, you know, human creators. And this is one of the best ways to absolutely do that. And with it, by the way, you now get Nebula classes as well, like Tony Sandos' series on video editing, videos just like this for YouTube, if you wanna do it yourself, or Tom Van Der Linden's series on analyzing stories. He is an absolutely brilliant mind and creator we can learn from. So go check out Nebula with my link down in the description below and get 40% off for an entire year. It's cheap as chips, really, to be perfectly honest. And there are tons of other creators, a whole bunch of other podcasts and exclusive content, game shows, yeah, uh, game shows, essays, 
uh, that you might know in the educational world. Let's all bring this together in a tangly wangly story webby summary, huh? Firstly, revenge stories depend on selling you on intense emotion. We do this with physicalization, but more importantly, framing in their introspection, showing how it interrupts their life and thoughts, and motivating a chain of decisions. Secondly, the chain of decisions colours the meaning of the eventual revenge, whether it's satisfying, depressing, or otherwise. Thirdly, Explore the personal and interpersonal costs of revenge. This can be done with a series of moral dilemmas or or questions. However, not all revenge arcs are negative. Some arcs see positive character development and make revenge more satisfying. Fourthly, explore the emotions beneath the emotion. Give your characters scenes to shift how they engage with them, especially as they pay the costs of revenge. Fifthly, revenge stories lend themselves to corruption arcs. Symmetricity, the villain atoning for their sins, or betrayal are all powerful forces here. Be careful though of cliché tropes. Sixthly, revenge stories are often about what happens after revenge. Consider what psychological elements you want to explore. Obsession, trauma, institutional failures at justice, or otherwise. And lastly, revenge can complicate the stories of others, create new obstacles, strain relationships, and shift the tension in the story. Figure out what they're tugging at in your story web. All my lights have died, I'm so professional, but here we go. Get on writing a world building volume two, volume three is coming at the end of the year, stay nerdy and I will see you in the future.